Um, I'm not a runner. I'm, I'm, not, I'm nothing like Paul Smith. <laughs> Paul Smith over there, he runs all the time. Um, but occasionally I go out running, and this past Monday I went out for a run um, out in the wilderness. And I went out for a run out in this park for two reasons. One, I like to get out into the woods, especially early in the week after I've preached and been here at church just to reflect and pray and think about my upcoming message. And it's been something that God has used um, in a profound way in my life, just getting out in nature. Um, so I recommend that to you. Also, um, I'd like to get in better shape. Um, so, you know, probably like a lot of us here, um, I, I'd like to be a little bit more fit than I am. So I start off on this run, and the f first part of a trail of this trail is uphill. And I'm like, oh, this is great, right? And so it takes me about three or four minutes to get to the top of the hill. And by the time I'm finished with running up that hill, I'm like finished. That's like all I got, you know? And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking I'm like frustrated that that's all I can do, and I'm already gassed, and I'm walking around this um, this forest reserve, and I'm reflecting on it, and I realize, um, you know, I can get in better shape if I'll do the exercise I can do, and then trust my body to do what only my body can do. So if I'll go out for runs, if I'll lift weights, or, or whatever it is, I can do what I can do, which is way less than I want to do, but I can do what I can do, and then I just have to trust my body to respond. Um, I do a fair amount of reading and thinking throughout the week. It's a big part of my job. I'm glad that I get to do that. And um, I'd like to become smarter, you know, because who wants to listen to a dumb pastor, you know? So um, I'm, I'm committed to lifelong learning, and I, I want to get smarter. And so I do a lot of reading and reflection. I realize I can get smarter if I do the reading and reflection I can do and trust my brain to do what only my brain can do. And I don't know much about brain science, but, you know, it's like making new, new neural pathways and that sort of thing. I think I'm somewhere in, um, accurate there. I also, you know, I really value relationships. And... Um, I want to connect with people, and I realize I can connect with others if I do the inviting and investing I can do and trust others to do what only they can do, which is respond and, you know, free up time and open themselves up to me. In other words, I, I realize that everything in life that I really want involves these two things, doing and trusting. There's a part that I can do, and there's a part that I just got to trust that it can be done. Or to put it a different way, everything really depends on faith. Even if you're not like a religious person, even if you've got a lot of questions, if you understand faith in the way that we've been talking about faith the past couple of weeks, then you realize that everything that you do depends on faith. Let me give you a definition of faith that I've showed every week. Faith is the ability to do what you can do and trust God to do what only God can do. I'd like you to memorize that. Can we say that together? Faith is the ability to do what you can do and trust God to do what only God can do. I want you to memorize this. It's in your bulletins. You can take it home. That's free. All right? I want you to memorize this because this is helpful. I truly believe this is helpful. Because in that moment when you're like, hey, I want to get healthier. Hey, I want to have more connections. Hey, I want to get smarter. Hey, I want whatever it is. If you'll just do what you can do and trust God to do what only God can do. You'll be amazed at what might happen. We're in the final week of a sermon series titled Moving Mountains. And this series was partly inspired because I went on vacation in the mountains, just transparent about that. Um, but more so, it's inspired by something incredibly encouraging that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 17. He says this, I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. And there's a literal mountain in the backdrop. But Jesus, I think, is using this as a metaphor. We all have these mountains in our lives. We all have these things that we want to move, these things that we want to get past. And, and the metaphor is profound because he's basically saying, you know, a mustard seed, is, it's really, really small. In fact, um, it's a ratio of 1 to 150,000 between a mustard seed and a mountain. And the point of pointing this out is just to say this. This is the good news. God can move more with less than you think. Jesus is saying, if you have just the small amount of faith, if you will do what you can do and then trust God to do what only God can do, the small amount, God can do more than you think. And last week I introduced this other idea that I've used for years now, that if you'll just do your 10%, 
What percentage of your life do you control? I don't know what that is. But let's just say it's 10%. There's a lot of things outside of your control. If you'll just do your 10% and then trust God with the 90%, what other people are going to do, what other people are going to say, how the weather is going to be, all these other factors that have an impact on you, if you'll just do what you can do and trust God to do what only God can do, God can move more with less than you think. But you got to have faith. Ooh, you got to have faith. <laughs> faith, 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 baby. Last week I told a story from Matthew chapter 14 where Jesus was able to get the disciples to do more with less than they thought they could. They had this situation where they had five loaves of bread and two fish, and there was this crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children, and Jesus tells them, I want you to feed them. And they're experiencing the gap, which is something you've experienced in your life when you look at what you have and you look at what is needed, and there's such a disparity between those two things. It feels like what you have is basically nothing. And that's what the disciples say. We have nothing except these two fish and five loaves of bread. And Jesus says to them, bring them here to me. And he's literally saying, bring the bread and bring the fish to me. But I I think that also this applies to us today because we experience that gap and we're like, you know, I only have a little bit of time. I only have a little bit of money. I only have a little bit of friendship. I only have a little bit of patience. I only have a little bit of courage, whatever it might be. You do have limits in your life. I only have a little bit of this. And Jesus says, well, bring that to me. Bring it here, because I can do more with less than you think. And that's the story. The 5,000 plus the women and children, they get fed, and there is food left over. So here's a question. If God truly can do this, and if you believe this just even a little bit, why don't we bring it? Why don't we more consistently bring what we have? Or to put it another way, if God can move mountains with a little bit of faith, why do so many of us have so little faith? Why is it that I sometimes just have a struggle believing that God can move mountains? Why do I have such a hard time doing what I can do sometimes? I just get paralyzed by the enormity of it, by the gap, the disparity. I I don't have the answer, but I got a story. Y'all want to hear the story? Come on, amen if you want to hear the story. Come on, all right, let's let's go back to Matthew chapter 14. It's the very next story after the feeding of the 5,000. Matthew says this, right then Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go ahead. Everybody say the boat. boat. Go ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. When he sent them away, he went up onto a mountain by himself to pray. Evening came and he was alone. He needed just get a little bit of alone time with God to recharge. Meanwhile, while Jesus, he's, you know, praying and and he's getting that alone time in the wilderness that is, is so healthy for us to do. Meanwhile, the boat fighting a strong headwind was being battered by the waves and was already far from land. Now, I think Matthew intends this to be a literal part of the story, right? Like the disciples are literally on the Sea of Galilee and they're being battered by the strong wind. But I also think this is a fantastic metaphor for how life is sometimes. Sometimes we commit to something and we're already far away from land. We're we're, we're too far down the road to be able to turn around. You know, you took that job. You married that man. You know, you, you, you did that thing. And you're too far to turn around. But you're getting battered by the winds and, and you're not making progress anymore. And this is the disciples, too far along to turn around, but they're not making any progress. Just life is just coming at them. Anybody feel this? You ever been there? Very early in the morning, he, that is Jesus, there's Jesus, if you can see him, he's in the waves, came to his disciples walking on the lake. It's a ghost. They were so frightened, they screamed. Ah! (laughs) Just keeping you awake, just keeping you awake. Okay. A lot of people are like, I was out late last night. I'm like, we need to scream in church. Okay. They were so frightened they screamed, be encouraged, 
Jesus says, it's me. Don't be afraid. Now, this word encourage in Greek is tharsio, which one of the definitions is a bold inner attitude. Have a bold inner attitude. It's me. Don't be afraid. Now, I just want to jump back to chapter 9 for a second. A couple bonus stories here for you. I'll be real quick. There's this one story about this man, and he's paralyzed. And he hears that Jesus is in town, and so he gets four of his friends to carry him on a stretcher. He's going to do what he can do. He heard that Jesus is in town, and so he gets some friends, calls them, hey, Jesus is here, come get me. They don't have phones back then, but hey, you know. And, and they're on the stretcher, and they bring him. Other stories say that they actually have to climb up onto the roof and break through the roof to get to Jesus. But Matthew doesn't tell that part, but that's irregardless. And so he shows up, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man who was paralyzed, be encouraged, Tharsio, bold in her attitude, my child. Be encouraged. Your sins are forgiven. You had enough faith to come here and believe I could do something about your physical ailment to improve your life right here and now. But I'm telling you, have a bold inner attitude. I can do even more. Then there's this woman, a, a few days later, Jesus, he's off going somewhere to do some cool stuff because that's what Jesus does, it's a bunch of cool stuff. And he's on his way traveling there, and this woman, she's, she's had this problem that's lasted for like 12 years. And Matthew says that she thought, if, only, if I only touch his robe, I'll be healed. If I just touch a little bit of him, God can do a lot. And so she finds Jesus in the crowd and she touches him. And Jesus turns to her, be encouraged. Have a bold inner attitude, daughter. Your faith has healed you. Faith, I think, requires a bold inner attitude attitude jumping over to hebrews for just a moment we don't know who the writer of hebrews is so i just call him herb herb the writer of hebrews so herb says this he says now faith is confidence in what we hope for assurance about what we do not see it's it's a bold inner attitude it's a, it's a confidence it's an assurance that you have within even though i don't see it i'm hoping for it and i believe it because i'm being bold with this inner attitude going back to the story in matthew peter replied lord if it is you they all just screamed right they're they're terrified they're they're all night they've been trying to make progress on the leg and they're just getting beat up and beat up and beat up and they're terrified. But Jesus says, have a bold inner attitude, guys. Don't be afraid. And Peter says, Lord, if it is you, order me to come to you on the water. And Jesus replies, that is a bold inner attitude, bro. I'm so impressed. Come on out. The water is warm. It's easy peasy, Peter. Of course, that's not what he says. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, come. Come. That's it. One word. And I got stuck on this this week. I'm like, there's something there. Like, this is significant to me. And what I, what I came up with, and maybe this is helpful, but I, I, I think it is. If you're waiting on a grand invitation that will overcome your hesitation, it's not going to come. If you're, whatever it is for you, whatever getting out of the boat is for you, whatever it is that, that that mountain that you're trying to climb, that mountain that you're trying to move, whatever it is in your life, it, and then you feel like, hey, maybe if I just do what I can do, God will do what only God can do. But you're waiting for this like grand invitation to be like, hey, you know, like the clouds part and like all this stuff happens that is, you know, probably not going to come. Maybe, I hope it does for you. But Jesus, you know, he's subtle sometimes. Put it a different way, um, faith is found in the face of fear, not in the absence of fear. And I, and I would love it that whatever you're facing and you're, and you're thinking about taking a risk and trying something new, trying to make a difference in that relationship, trying to make a difference at that workplace, but you're afraid because it might not go well. But faith is found in the face of fear, not in the absence of fear. Then Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water towards 
Jesus. Some of you might not have known that Jesus wasn't the only one to walk on water. Peter's walking on water, which is remarkable. But the thing I keep thinking about when I read this is, why are the other disciples still in the boat? I mean, they, they didn't get the invitation, but they didn't ask. I mean, right? Peter's the one, hey, at, you know, Lord, if it's you, command me. But they could have asked. And wouldn't you, once you saw Peter walking on water, that's pretty cool. That's a story to tell your grandchildren. I think the reason they don't get out of water is that simply this. You know, if you get out of the boat, it's possible you will sink. It's possible. But it is certain you will get wet. If you get out of the boat, you might sink. It might not go well. I hope it does for you. It's a risk, right? This is why we're talking about it, because much of life involves these risks. It's hard. If you get out and you take that risk, you might sink. Maybe, maybe not. But you will get wet. In other words, if, if you choose to do what you can do, you're going to get your hands dirty. If you choose to do what you can do and you respond to that call, whatever that is in your life, you're going to get committed. You're going to have to get up when you don't want to get up. You're going to have to go when you don't feel like going. It's going to, you know, you're going to get wet. It's going to cost you. It's going to inconvenience you. And I think that we don't have faith because we just don't want to get wet sometimes. But when Peter saw the strong wind, he became frightened. And as he began to sink, he shouted, Lord, rescue me. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, You man of weak faith, why did you begin to have doubts? I mean, you got out of the boat. The time for doubts is before you step out, you know? But now you're out, you're walking on water, and and. You, it was windy before you got out of the boat. You knew that there was waves and wind, right? Like when you take that risk, you know that there's risks. You know that there's dangers. You know that there's going to be difficulty. You knew that before you got out of the boat. Why did you start doubting? This is the time to trust. One of the commentaries I read about this story this week, uh, R.T. France, he says, it, the doubt that Jesus is talking about, denotes not so much a theological uncertainty or unbelief, but a practical hesitation, wavering, being in two minds. It's not like Peter just stopped believing in Jesus and God and the whole shebang. It's far more practical. It's far more simple than that. It's that moment that you've really stepped out and, and, and you need to believe, you need to keep going. And then you just start hesitating. You start losing your nerve. That's what Peter does. Put it another way. He was doing his 10%, but not trusting God with the 90%. He did what he could do. He asked for the invitation. He got out of the boat. But then he took his eyes off Jesus, and he started worrying about everything else. And he stopped trusting, and he started sinking. A few weeks later, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus, he starts asking the disciples, like, who, who are people saying that I am? And they give him a variety of answers. And then he says to the disciples, who do you say that I am? I want your opinion. And Peter, he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He's stepping out of the boat. He's taking a risk. He's declaring what he believes. And Jesus, he blesses him for it. In fact, he gives him his nickname, which is Peter. His real name is Simon. Peter means rock. And so success. Peter's walking on water here. He got out of the boat. Then Jesus, he starts to teach the disciples that he's going to get arrested. He's going to go to Jerusalem, be arrested. He's going to have to suffer many things. He's going to die on a cross and three days later be resurrected. And Peter gets out of the boat again. And he says, heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus replies, get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. Peter is sinking again out of the boat. Towards the end of the ministry, Jesus, he's just had the Last Supper, which we're going to celebrate after I finish preaching. He's with his disciples. And he begins to tell them, he says, you know, all of you are going to desert me. 
I'm going to get arrested, and every one of you are going to say that you don't know me. And Peter declares, he's getting out of the boat, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Out of the boat, taking a risk. I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times, deny three times that you even know me, sinking again. This is life, isn't it? And faith, getting out of the boat, is risky. And there's dangers all around. But you know what? Peter goes on to get out of the boat several more times in his life. He ends up becoming one of the leaders of the church and impacting lives. There's this guy named Cornelius. He's like a Roman officer. And Peter has this weird dream. You'll have to read about it. It's in the book of Acts. It's a strange dream. And then guy shows up at his door. And he's like, I, I'm here to bring you to Cornelius. And Peter's like, okay, I'll go. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can do. And he shows up to Cornelius' house. And he's like, I shouldn't even be in a house like yours because you're a Gentile and I'm a Jew. But I had this strange dream. And I'm l reflecting on it. So I'm going to go ahead and come in and share the gospel. And we're told that Cornelius and his entire household are saved. Peter. Sometimes he gets out of the boat and walks on water. Sometimes he sinks. But over time, over time, he develops this skill of faith that allows him to be of great use for the kingdom of God. As he becomes a church leader, he writes a couple letters that we actually still have from history, First and Second Peter. And in First Peter, here's what he says about this up and down, this, this walking on water and the sinking in the water, this pattern, this risk of faith that we're all called to do. He says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. The, the times where it doesn't work out, if it always worked out for you, would it be a risk? He's just like stepping out of the boat, walking on water anytime I want, you know? These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is more precious than mere gold. The faith itself, this ability, is more precious than gold. Put it this way, faith is a means to an end. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, God can use that and move mountains. It's a means to an end. It can make an impact in your life. You want to get in better shape. You do what you can do. You trust God to do what only God can do. Work through your body and make you fitter. If you want to get smarter, you read, you reflect, you do what you can do. If you want more friends, you, you reach out, you invite. You do what you can do and trust God to do what only God can do. It is a means to an end. It's, it's, it's something that God can use in your life to make a difference in your life. Faith is a means to an end, but it's also an ends. It's something that has value just in itself. It's more precious than gold. Peter says, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise, glory, and honor on the day. What day? The day that you step out of the boat? Didn't bring Peter much honor and glory on that day, did it? He sunk. I mean, that's the day we want it. And actually, sometimes it will be that day but he's talking about a different day. He says, it will bring you much praise, glory, and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Put it another way, faith may lead to failure now, but in the end, it will win. It's worth it. It's a means to an end, but it's also an ends. And Peter is saying, look, hey, I've gotten out of the boat. I, you know, I've spoken up and I answered some questions right and some things are really wrong. And I made a fool of myself over and over again. And you know who never left me? Jesus never left me. And because I was willing to do what I can do and take that risk over and over again, sometimes misguided, okay, I'll admit that. But I took that risk and I practiced that faith and I kept trusting. And over time, God built up that faith strong and I was able to make a huge impact. And I'm just telling you, at some point in time, it's going to be worth it. Faith is the ability to build. Faith is the ability that you build by getting out of the boat. 
and keeping your eyes on Jesus. Get out of the boat. So that's my encouragement to you. Whatever it is, get out of the boat. It's worth getting wet. It's worth it. It's worth it. Let us pray.